We shall move along then to the district goals report, ACT and AP. So um, the last two board meetings we've reported out on the academic achievement and school culture district goals. And so tonight we'll report out on the last four performance indicators, which are the two ACT performance indicators, which is the composite ACT and the college readiness benchmarks. And so we'll start there before moving on to the two AP indicators. So if you look at page uh, 22, I believe, of the board packet, um, you'll see the composite ACT for the graduating class of 2015 was a 23.3. Um, our prediction for this class based on their entrance explore was a 23.08 and our predictions are just based off of um, we take an average of the growth from previous uh, classes and then we use that number to predict what we think that their uh, composite score will be so keep in mind um, typically uh, expected growth from explore to plan is about five points and then that varies depending on um, whether or not students come in and are academically at risk. They tend to grow um, less than five points. The chart below that in the additional information just shows that we, how we track um, each graduating class as they come in and then the assessments that they give. Um, as you can see for the class of 2017, we've stopped giving the plan test and that's because um, the state and ACT has discontinued the Explore Plan series that lead into um, the ACT. So we still have uh, an old plan test that we gave to um, freshmen, but we decided it would be better for sophomores to give them a practice ACT. And so that's why they don't have a plan test. Um, so you can see the graduating class of 2015 grew 6.15 points, and the class of 2016 right now grew 5.2 points from Explore to Plan. Um, so that's still over um, the expected growth, and uh, you'll hear from Ms. Gregor later of what we're doing this year to help those seniors still try to improve that ACT score, so hopefully that growth will go up and that composite um, ACT will go up before reporting out next year um, to hopefully encourage um, get more students to improve their ACT score um, and then the predictions on the last and the bottom of this page um, shows again what we predict for each graduating class and like I said this prediction is just based off of um, the last four years of average growth which was 5.95 points so that's why um, there's no adjustment. So one of the questions was when you look from the graduating class of 2016 compared to the class of 2017, um, those students performed lower on the practice ACT as a sophomore uh, group, but we're still predicting them to be higher. And we're still making that prediction off of their Explore eighth grade test because that's just one data point and so it could have been a variety of reasons why those students didn't perform well on that one day. Um, so we're still using our initial, um, we're still using our initial predict prediction. And then we're also using ECRA to identify which of those students didn't grow as much as they should have or didn't meet benchmarks so that as juniors we can provide additional interventions, some of which you'll hear from Ms. Gregor later today. Um, so that's just a report on the composite ACT. When you go to the next page, you'll look at the college readiness benchmarks, which is another performance indicator. And you can see the percent of the graduating class of 2015 that um, met each benchmark. And just as a reminder, the benchmark score is the minimum score needed on an ACT subject area test to indicate a 50% chance of obtaining a B or higher or about a 75% chance of obtaining a C or higher in the corresponding credit-bearing classes. In Kristen, college. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. there, there's an asterisk about uh, uh, for 2012 that these percentages do not include students who receive extra time on the ACT. Is that just for that year? Or is just for that year. Okay, the state changed how they reported it, which explains um, the, the numbers. Yeah. Um, Underneath the additional information just tracks the EPAS growth per subject area for each class. 
Um, and then again, the predictions based on their eighth grade explore test. There was a question when you compare the two charts in that area as to why um, the class of 2016 as juniors appeared to have fewer students meeting um, benchmarks than they did as eighth grade. So a couple of reasons. The eighth grade prediction is a completely different test, so it's just their prediction as to what percentage they think students will actually um, meet the ACT benchmarks. But also, um, we sometimes will gain students or lose students from when they took that test as an eighth grader. So we're not necessarily comparing the exact 375 students to the exact 375 students due to students that transfer in and out. Um, and so again, uh, you'll hear from Ms. Gregor in a minute of how we're trying to um, get some of those numbers to go back up, um, even though they're seniors, so that um, we can encourage them to take the national test coming up in October um, to improve their scores. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Gregor. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Which is more reliable? You're saying we're using averages to, you know, predict this because there's reasons it could have varied. But, you know, again, what's the comfort factor for us? Should we use the averages? Is it really more accurate? Or should we, especially with a class, you know, the one class is already what they're juniors now, right? Well, some schools will just use the strict national average of five points. So we are trying to get a little more um, precise by using our average growth of over the last four years because we exceed the five points typically. I understand year. that, but what, what I'm asking is, I mean, you and Kevin, you, you know, you people understand statistical analysis and studied all this. I didn't. I'm just, you know, asking, is it better for us to continue to use averages even as we gather more information? or? And, and, you know, again, two years from now, we'll be able to say, look, get the report from two years ago. You said we should use an average, and they didn't. Again, ho hopefully they're going to approve. As you said, at least go to the average. But what's a better way? Is, is Are we doing it the right way, I guess, by saying we're using averages instead of looking more at that, what's happened so far with the particular class and me, you know, whether the average is really a good indicator at this point? That, that's all I'm trying to ask you. Well, the only other option for us um, that's feasible is to look at the national average, which is five points. And if we use that, then we're going to consistently exceed that every year. So um, we can work with ACRA to see if they can provide additional um, an no, additional predict prediction that's not necessarily based off of an average. No, you're, you're missing my point, Kristen. I'm sorry. I'm saying for a specific class that so far hasn't perform versus eighth grade now the way we would hope to date, does it still make sense for us to use the average for that class to predict what's going to happen two years from now versus looking at that specific, uh, what do we call them, the group, uh, the class? Cohort. Cohort, thank you. That cohort and saying, based on what we know now, what's a little bit different than these averages. No, I understand that. And I'm saying that would be something where we could um, work with ACRA okay. to see if they could provide us um, predictions based on where the students come in. And, and, um, and more importantly, like you said, the real goal is regardless if wherever they are now, maybe we have to work a little harder and have them work a little harder to get up where they should be, right? Mm -hmm. That's really what we're trying to accomplish here, regardless of how you do the right. analysis, right? Okay. So before we go into, I think there were, I, I have, this is an area where I was key marked, and this is probably an area where I specifically added to the superintendent's bonus performance, specifically benchmarking off of other schools who tend to come in, because I've looked at the 10-year, 15-year, 20-year average of RBs, ACT scores, and they're always 22, 23, 22, 23, 22, 23. So how are we going to get this off of the 22, 23 to comparable to the Hinsdale Centrals of the world where they're up at higher Deerfields of the world where they're you know higher 27? How are we going to get that average up there? And 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 you know can't do it at six percent growth if if, uh, if the feeder schools are consistently only giving us at 16. There's 17. I mean, that growth has to come then in at 10 
in order to get to the 27. So how are we going to get that growth to get to 10 or to 9 or to 8? So um, Ms. Greger is going to talk about some of those areas. Um, and I think one area, too, is continuing to work with our feeder schools because um, the higher levels that students can come in at, um, the more typically students grow um, in high school, and so the more likely they're so able the to be successful. So another question but is to benchmark, okay, so the other schools that I mentioned that are coming in with their average ACTs of 26, 27, what is their population coming in at? Yeah, from or in other words, what is their growth in high school? And then what is their growth coming in at? So that we can benchmark against, not them at, because we don't want to just be the Illinois State average. Mm -hmm. We want to be average. So we don't want to benchmark ourselves against five. We want to benchmark against those those elite schools, and we want to be get there, right? Right. So in November or December, um, we're going to have a presentation <coughs> from ACRA, and they'll be, be able to provide us two reports. One report where they create a model school based off of our demographics um, for our students and you know our EAV and all of these different characteristics um, and create um, an ideal school that matches you know what our demographics are to see whether or not we're exceeding where we should be or not. And then the other report that they're going to do is pull um, information from the top 10 schools in the state based off of their ACT and compare uh, our performance to theirs. Um, we couldn't do it at this meeting because they have to pull from the information on the school report card, which doesn't get updated until the end of October. So we will be able to answer some of those questions, at least how we're doing comparatively um, later this year. One thing that will throw a wrench into this slightly is the state moving to this park because everybody was using this uh, this e-pass system because it was an e. It started basically was the four four year tracking or four year pro progress monitoring tool to see how students were performing on ACT, and now with the state kind of abandoning that, we've been using retired Explore test uh, that we score ourselves. So compared to then the ACT, which is obviously nationally issued, and but are we are we losing that? Are we going to lose the the Explore data going forward? As long as we continue to, I mean, eventually we're going to have to figure out what company out there can start giving us an entry level test that can help project performance on an ACT because we've been recycling ex expired or retired Explore tests now for about. A few years. Three to four years. We should be able to use um, in placing students that are coming in as freshmen. We also rely on map test data, so we should be able to use that data in addition to eventually park data, um, and then we can work with ACRA to utilize that data to um, still give us a projection as to where students. So, are so how are other schools um, monitoring their growth? Right now, if they're still doing a retired Explore test. Yeah. But eventually there'll come a point in time where that's why there was such a strong push from the out. high schools to keep the ACT and not the park because we've been trying we've kind of like got a system down now where kids can come in as freshmen we can see where they're at we know some national norms of how much they should be growing and how much and that's all changing on us but building on Gary's point is if our students are coming in here but we're growing this month and in the other school high schools he did they're coming in higher and then the the range of growth might be smaller than what we're doing to bring it up there and that's what you're looking at right no we don't we don't, we don't know. know what the range of yeah. growth is right so Kristen is it we can we can be losing a lot of eighth graders because our ACT average is 22 23 and they believe they go to a parochial school leaving that they're going to a school that has always consistently graduated people at 28 or 29, and we lose those lead students. And therefore, it brings the eighth grade average down. I don't know. Is it in the public domain, the what the eighth grade students are coming in from some of the other schools that Gary mentioned, and the growth over their four-year tenure, is that public information no not usually unless that unless it's well Hinsdale Central is it uh, is it on their web they're yeah. one of the few districts that do okay. that information is not on the school report card just the final ACT score but if 
the for the public schools in the state, do they have to report the testing results that, that you show here for the eighth graders? No. Oh, they don't. And they're not using the Explorer anymore, so. So then it's hard for us to benchmark or, or to get that data to benchmark against some of these schools. Are there services that can provide that? Well, that's what we're using that's what we're for. That's yeah, what yeah. she's going to do for us. They're, they're, what was the company's name that we hired? Eckler. Yeah, we gonna, hired them last year. But they're going to do the 10 elite schools. Did, right. Did gonna, we want to give them a list of schools that we're interested in? Or? Well, we want to go after the we're elite, planning, don't we? So what they were th what they were planning on doing was just um, taking the top 10 public schools, um, which would be determined based on the ACT average. So that's how they were going to do it. But if you would like a different method, we could use a different method. No, well, I, I want to go after, to I want to benchmark against the top 10 yeah. as opposed yeah. to the average for yeah. Illinois. They'll also bench, like when they, um, in the report, they'll, not only will they look at our academic performance, but they'll look at attendance, graduation, everything that's reported on the school report. And they'll match it with demographics also? They'll do two versions. They'll do top 10, and then. Um, but will they give us the demographics of the top 10? Yes. I can ask, yes. Yeah, so that way we can. That's important. Yeah. Right, because we're also going to have some other variables in that test so that the board can see what they're spending per, per student, what we're spending per student, average class size, some of the things are all reported on the school report card. I mean, I just caution that if we're comparing against 10, they, they really need to be comparable to suburban high schools. I don't want, you know, the comparison to Chicago, North Park, or whatever. No, it's the top 10 non selective. So, a Magden school, we told them not to put in there. Okay. It's the top 10 public high schools. Not, and no, no, no Walter Caton where, where they get the hand pick. Right. right. Northside prep. Right. They'll also compute the state average. So, they'll have the average, they'll have it compared to a, an uh, ideal school of our demographics, and then they'll have it to the top 10 schools. Can we compare against LT and Hinsdale? If they're in the top if ten, they're, they're if they're top in the top 10, 10, what if, they what if they're not in the? Can we add? Can we request to add that? Let me look into it. Yeah. Okay. That's why I said you want to pick schools because what well, if they're not in the top ten? Yeah. Right. That's why we're doing the second report based on our demographics, school of our demographics, <clears throat> so that we can see where we stack up there. So at this point, Ms. Greger is going to talk about some of the new <laughs> things we're doing this Finally, year. Finally, Kyle, sorry. And then some of the um, things that we're going to continue to do to uh, improve ACT performance. Thank you. Um, so some of the new pieces, um, initiatives, or parts of our plan that are new for us this year, the first deals with those students who are in the current senior class, the class of 2016, um, who did not meet ACT benchmarks or their projected score as ECRA um, reported, as identified by ECRA. And what we're working with on those students is we're giving that group of students an opportunity to um, attend eight sessions of ACT prep courses provided by our teaching staff um, here at RB. And um, those students, after participating in those eight sessions prior to the October 24th National ACT Test Day, if students come to all eight of those sessions and register and take the October 24th National Test um, through the Arthur Foundation grant, we are going to refund their registration cost for that October 24th national test. So we are packaging that as a way for those students to improve not only on their past performance for themselves, but that gives us an opportunity um, to look at where they fall sort of on our scale once they've had a little bit of extra service um, provided. And we've had some um, really good interest in that. The students um, and many of the parents are very excited about that opportunity and are signing up and, and taking advantage of that. Um, another thing that's new for us, and Carnegie Learning was just here last week working with our geometry team from our math department um, and implementing the Carnegie curriculum in all geometry courses. Um, that curriculum is the same that we adopted for all of our algebra courses last year. So this is part of the vertical alignment piece. And Carnegie Learning, all of their curricula is linked to Common Core Standards. So it's reflective of the Common Core Standards um, on which the students are assessed. That's what feeds into PARC. Um, so that is something new that we're working through this year. Um, also, we are working on piloting a student growth component, and there are 13 teachers who have signed up to um, run through the student growth pilot, and ECRA data is providing those participants 
um, professional development on how to analyze individual student progress. And then through that, implement individualized learning plans for students based on their reading and ac academic vocabulary assessment. So 13 of our teachers will have an opportunity to pilot that process this year that we will then move into full swing um, for next year. So those are just some of the new things that we're bringing in this year um, as a, a way to improve some of our ACT numbers. We are also, of course, working on the continued practices that we've implemented in the past that have worked very successfully for us, such as literacy coaching. Um, and that is something that we use to support teachers in the implementation of literacy-specific curriculum development uh, and enhancement, as well as providing teachers with instructional strategies and support in the areas of literacy. Um, also, ECRA, another thing that ECRA does for us is they give us an opportunity to look at our program success. So ECRA is able to analyze numbers that come out of, for example, the C-Team or the CAP program, and they're able to let us know how we can make those specific programs better um, and more impactful for students. Um, also, we're continuing to encourage and support student-centered instruction um, through formative assessment, technology, and the professional development opportunities, as Kristen mentioned earlier. Um, and then we have been, throughout the course of the last few years, really rigorously implementing ACT-style questions into our curriculums, especially in math, social studies, and science. Um, and we're working to continue that practice in those departments while at the same time utilize the work that those departments have been doing to influence more um, ACT style questions and analysis in other courses so that those teachers in those departments can take the lead and sort of mentor that process along with the rest of the staff. Can you just help again, and you're new, so Kevin or Kristen can answer, but you say things like, we're gonna implement student-centered curriculum. You know, it sounds like a great buzzword, but if you go back to Gary's point, how are we going to get our ACTs from 22 to 25? First of all, we didn't have student-centered curriculum so far. If this is a new concept. I mean, what does that even mean? And how is it going to help our students do better? You know, get their, you're talking about ACTs. How is it going to get the ACT scores up? Um, what, one of the things when we talk about student-centered instruction, um, there's a difference in it, and there's a great article called um, from stage on the, Sage on the Stage to Guide on the Side. And it's the concept that years and years ago, when I was in high school, um, when I was in elementary school, was the delivery of instruction to students, and that was kind of the educational model. So a teacher stands up in front of a classroom full of students, and I deliver you the model. I deliver you the examples, I deliver you the definitions and the teaching, and you as a student sit quietly in your desk and you receive all of that and you take it in. And what has become the trend in education because of the development of, of students and the development of the world around us is that we've noticed that if students are more actively engaged in what they're doing, and that just makes sense, if I stat and lectured at you, it would be much less valuable to you than if I were engaging you in a conversation where you take part and I take part. So when we say student-centered instruction, what we mean is we want to move away from that idea of um, sage on the stage where the teacher has information that we disseminate to students and we allow the students to be active participants in that. How that directly impacts ACT is that it has been known that if students are involved in, in the process of their learning and if they see connections between their learning and their life and they're actively engaged rather than just sitting and listening, they tend to retain more information. They become more inquisitive because they're active participants in that and it, it's not something that's just happening to them. So as far as increasing their skill set for the ACT, what we're hopeful is that, and, and what we know from research is that when students are actively engaged, they retain more and they are um, more excited about learning. They're more apt to ask questions. They're more apt to follow up on those questions. So while student-centered learning has always been something that has been recognized a as a, a practice that is valuable in education, we've come to a swing or a time in education where now it's recognized as best, best practice. And it's just the pendulum kind of swinging that way in education. And so we continue to develop our skills of inquiry with the national, you know, the For example, putting a computer in everybody's hand. Right. 
and now so that kids are doing more investigatory learning and reporting out to the teacher in the class instead of the teacher assigning projects and go find this or go. All right, that was a very good explanation. I appreciate yeah, that. Thank you. Are there any other um, I, ACT plan Yes, yeah, we, we, we average about 90 transfer students in a year. So how do you track those on an ACT performance? Because if you say 90 a year, potentially you got three years worth. So let's say we have about 180 of transfer schools within transfer students within a population. It's almost 10% of your pop student population. How are you tracking that as a potential impact on the ACT? So and uh, how do you catch how do you catch their, where they are in the pendulum of things? So a majority of our transfer students are typically freshmen, so those will stu students that will come in and we will still give them an explore test so that we can place students. Um, the difficulty will be in the future when students come in um, as sophomores and juniors, they won't have that explore because other, stu other schools uh, may or may not be giving that. But what we do is they'll still take whatever assessment we're giving them, whether it's a practice ACT that year or a plan test, and that information still goes into ACRA and they still um, will help us determine whether or not um, that student is growing as much as they should. Um, so that's the way we track But it can skew our data at the end that the board's recording yes. for goal purposes. Yes, for strictly EPAS growth. I have two questions. Uh, the first one, do we offer uh, like a mini workshop for our students on how to take a test? It's been reborn just learning how to take the test, you know, cross out the ones that are wrong and helps improve so we their have scores. Our, we have our CAP curriculum mm -hmm. and we also offer um, the, the, the test prep for the test prep program seniors. that's before. And, and during their junior year, too, we also offer RB prep, which is either sessions before school, after school, or on Saturdays. So they get that as juniors, and now we're expanding that to seniors um, before they take the national test again. Okay. And then the uh, the pilot that ACRA is doing with our, is that part of the service that we can expect from them in the future? Uh, in, in the pilot of, with the 13 instructors where they'll learn how to use their own data, will that be part of our service going forward? Yeah, that's something that once after the pilot year, the student growth pilot year, so when we move into next year, that's something that all teachers will have an opportunity to be able to go into the ECRA system, download their particular students from our master list, and be able to take a look at the snapshot of that particular student. So when you pull up that information, if I pulled up John Smith, I'm able to see not only what he's done in the year that I have him in my class, but since ECRA uploads all of the data from the time that they enter, RB, I'm able to see a historical picture of that student and how that student has grown throughout the years so that when I am working with my students in my class, I am working less in theory and more from this is the actual snapshot picture right in front of me of my students and how do I work to move this particular set of students forward. Mm -hmm. I ask one other question. The, I mean, there's so many variables that go into how kids do on ACT and you said some of the parents and students were happy about some of this prep you're doing but since almost all of our students go to college at some level do the families and the students throughout understand you know the significance of get an extra point or two on your ACT might get you into a different school or get you into a different program or or get you more money at a private school do, do you think that I mean I know you have programs where you can come and explain it to them, but do you, do you think there's, uh, you know, the message is understood by our whole student body and their guardians and parents? Or, you know, is that an issue? Or I, don't, I don't know that it can. And I realize you don't have well, history, and, and but and you've done it at other can, schools. I don't know that we can make the global generalization, generalization of do we know that everybody fully understands it. What we can do from our aspect through our CAP courses through our, our opportunities at RB Prep and, and when we have the students in front of us and is make sure that that, that, that is one of our selling points. And, okay. and that's one of the ways that we sell students on providing them extra opportunities. Well, why should I come to this extra opportunity? I took the test and it's good enough to get me 
to X school. So what we really try to stress through our CAP and through, you know, I met personally with all of our seniors that are that we offered this opportunity to, and so we really do try to drive that okay. home with the with the students to let them know that sometimes one point could be thousands of dollars. Right. Okay. Thank you. I'll go into AP now. We yeah. are. So um, for AP, we have two performance indicators. The first performance indicator is AP Equity and Excellence. And as a reminder, AP Equity and Excellence is a percent of a school's entire 12th grade class, of so the class of 2015, who scored a three or higher on at least one exam at some point in their high school career. So it may have been their sophomore year, their junior year, their senior year. Um, and so for the graduating class of 2015, that was 55 percent um, and so you can see the increase from 2014 to 2015 but that translates you know to over half of our graduating class leaving our BE with some sort of college credit um, and you know even if students don't pass the class or pass the test they still get that experience that then translates to um, more success when they have to take that course in college so um, it's benefiting well beyond the 55.7 percent of that graduating class. Um, the other performance indicator that we report out on is AP students with passing scores. Um, so of the AP students um, that took an AP exam last year, 70.4 percent of them passed at least one exam. You can see that number decreased a little bit from 2014 to 2015. However, we gave 30, there were 39 more AP students last year and 170 more AP exams that were given. Um, and th there was a total of 1,249 exams last year, and that's the most exams that RB has ever administered. So um, it's natural when you see more students taking a test and more exams given that um, that number will, uh, that pass rate could drop a little bit. So uh, we're hopeful that that will go back up um, the following year. Do our uh, parents know about the new law that if they get a three and go to a state school, that the school has to accept their credit? Um, we put it in the newsletter, and that's also something you'll see when Ms. Gregor reports out on um, some of our plans for improving enrollment in AP something that she's going to stress to the parents as well. Um, and then we have added some individual successes in a few particular courses. Um, st these are courses in which we had more students take the exam and the average score increased and the pass rate increased. So you can see those courses listed there. Um, we've also provided you the current and past enrollment um, and pass rates for um, each department. So you can see the trends. Um, by department and then the other data that we've provided which is on page 27 is um, a chart that outlines the pass rates um, the number of exams given for each particular exam and the average exam score um, and there was a question on this um, you know how do we determine which classes we should particularly focus on should we look at pass rates? should we look at um, average score should we have a cut score um, and so we're always focusing on increasing pass rates while also increasing enrollment. And specifically, when you look at the report following that from College Board, we tried to look at the number of ones for a course and decrease the number of ones to hopefully you know, bump those students who got ones up to uh, a two and so forth. But we always look at the number of ones to see if we can improve upon that. Um, and then we do try to always look at can we beat the state average and if we're below that what can we do to improve upon um, that area so that's typically where um, we focus um, as you can see with the 1,249 exams uh, we have an open enrollment policy here at RB which really means that if a student wants to take an AP course for most AP courses that aren't sequential we allow that student to do that whereas other schools um, they have to meet particular prerequisites, whether it's taking particular courses or having a certain GPA or previous grades. Um, so at this point, uh, if there are specific questions about the data, I can answer that. Or um, if not, Ms. Greger can go into some of our plans to increase not only enrollment but pass rates.
We're on page 26. We're on page 26. Kylie, in the sake of time, why don't you summarize what we're doing to uh, increase? So some of our new initiatives are um, trying to look at why our students, in some cases, are experiencing level changes, which means perhaps starting in an AP course and then not continuing in that course. Um, we're also working to offer this summer an intro to AP workshop for students who have never had an AP course to teach them some of the foundational skills that they need to be successful in any AP course and in an AP program. Um, also creating peer-to-peer -peer tutoring opportunities with students who have successfully com completed AP courses, increasing our outreach um, to parents specifically with uh, mind paid to that legislation that is um, mandating that public colleges in Illinois offer students credit if they earned a three or better on an AP exam in high school, and then um, continuing the implementation practices of aligning our courses within each department so that we have a, a vertical alignment that makes sense with the scaffolding of skills, um, supporting our professional development on a biannual basis, as Kristen mentioned earlier, um, to make sure that our AP teachers have access to AP professional development. Um, we're going to continue exposing our students to authentic resources, sample questions, sample retired tests, and also um, encourage support and collaboration not only between teachers of AP in the same subject, but across departments to pick up on skills that are AP skills, not necessarily course specific, but skills that deal with reading and analysis and um, writing and so forth. Any questions? Great job. Great explanation for both of you. One thing I just want the board to say, I think a year or two ago when uh, we set these goals and the, the task that was assigned or the way I interpreted it was start looking at data from when they walk in our doors or when they're about to walk in our doors and until they leave and how we're tracking their progress and putting projections up. And I hope you see that the work of the, of the building administration and the faculty here are, are doing what you asked. You know, uh, uh, going to that point, you, you mentioned in here uh, last year 29% of the class of 2016 took and passed the exam as juniors, 19 the class of 2000 took and passed as a sophomores. Can you, what was the 2015 class's pass rate as juniors? And can that get an indication of where do you think next year's, the 2016, is going to wind up being as a percent? Um, I can pull that up really quickly. Um, those are the numbers that AP reports, and so it's not cumulative. So that's not saying that um, only 29% of the juniors, that's just saying that year the juniors had 29%. So that's the problem with that uh, that's AP that. report, is no, that it doesn't compare that, but I could look that up. So never quick. mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I was just seeing if that's a predictor that you can try to use as a, to know where you think the percent's going to wind up being for next year. That's your bet. Right. I, I have to say that the table on 28 probably surprised me more than any of the AP tables. And I think it represents a shift in our education. You know, a lot of times we'd hear that, oh, we're pushing AP too much, or we're, you know, the kids are stressed. Uh, that's all RB, you know, cares about is the AP. But then when I looked at how we compare it to the state, we're not that far. We don't, we're not that much greater than what the state of Illinois is doing. And so to me, uh, when I looked at this, not, I said. That's not true. I don't think that's good, right? Well, when I look, it says the globe, the Illinois is the green bar. So when you look at that green bar, and the next, then that table, if you bring it up. The five-year uh, summary or? No, not that's that one. Keep going. Page, page 28. 28. Next page, Marianne. 28, yeah, right yeah. there. So we look yes. at the green bar, it's we look at the blue bar, 66% compared to 70%. So it says percent total of AP students with scores above three. So the state average is not that much lower than our B's and for each of the last years so to me that looks you know, we've had criticism that we push AP too much you know it's too much stress on the kids but I think all of education is saying no it's a competitive market AP is important it's here to stay 
Don't we have a greater percentage of our kids taking AP? We have yeah. a lot higher yeah. than most so schools. That, that brings down the average of the past, right? Well, but the state has more kids than they do, so they would regress to the mean more than we would. Yeah, but the, would, would, I think Ed's point, Laura, is twofold. Um, Kristen already covered one. A lot of schools have requirements you have to meet before you can take an AP that would means they're higher performing students take an AP, so they should have a higher pass rate versus somebody who's open enrollment. And the second one is there's still pro a lot of schools that don't offer very many AP courses. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd be willing to bet if you get on a state basis, there's plenty of schools that it's a very low participation rate. So if you're taking, um, you know, the fact that we don't require, have uh, prerequisites, the, you know, if you looked at it that way and we have such a high percentage of students taking them, you almost would expect us to be maybe lower, not to even to be, be lower, be, than, be the lower than the average, than higher than the average. And if you, but if we look at the entire state of Illinois, I mean... But this isn't like the higher, entire state of uh, ACT where everybody has to take the test. So right. you can't hide the fact that, you know, every student took and here's my score or whatever park or whatever they're doing. This is one where it's individualized by the school who can take ACT, and a lot of schools push it for their higher performing students, and we feel, we've pushed the fact that we think it's helpful to all students. So I think the fact that we're you know, higher than the state, higher than the global, is also another indicator that we're doing a pretty good job. Exactly. Or school, but, what, but my point was saying is that we're not out of the ordinary. We're not out of the ordinarily pushing AP, which has been a criticism of RB, that we put too much emphasis on our AP tests. Well, I don't know if you can say that from this report, from this Laura, report, because uh, you don't have a comparison to the no total number of students enrolled in the state of Illinois as a, compare, a percentage of, to what, of what that number's taking. Correct. Yeah. We can look at ours individually and say we have 533 students taking an AP exam compared to our population of 1,660, or it's 33, or what, but we don't know this 105, 600 compared to a million high school students, 500,000 high school students. We don't know that comparison for you to say that. Gary, to go back to your last point, yeah. um, so for the graduating class of 2015, as juniors, 36% of the class took and passed an exam. And so for the class of 2016 as juniors, that was 29%. So you could suggest that that's gonna go down, but it could also be dependent on what they do as seniors and what they right. do as sophomores. Okay. okay, I know this is our discussion meeting. Is any further discussion in a great job by both these areas? Thank you very much. Just, well, I'll, I'll just make one suggestion to you. My son just uh, started school in Ohio. Ohio's got that law, too. So if you're going to advertise, you might, I'm sure, the college board can tell you which states require the schools. To, so that's, it might be a little bit more incentive. You know, the, the, you could go to, the kids could go to school in another state and still have to get, be given credit for it. And it's state schools as opposed to private schools? Yeah, it's the University of Cincinnati. It's a state school. Okay, thank you very but much. But it's a state law there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job, Chris. It's a law.